Welcome back. I am Jared Case, curator of film exhibitions at the Dryden Theater and the George Eastman Museum. And for many of you who have been following us online, you know that we had intended to open up this week with a, a week full of programming dedicated to the magic of the movies and going to the movies. Uh, I have the special pleasure of having the director of two of those films that we're planning on showing this week, April Wright, with us. And she is going to talk about her two going attractions films. Uh, the first one is about driving theaters, and the second one is about movie palaces. So, welcome, April. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I, I wish I was playing there on your screen inside the <laughs> inside the museum, uh, but this is the situation we're in right now. <laughs> yep, we we are keeping tabs on exactly when we can open, and we'll try to respond as quickly as we can. And we hope to have some of your films uh, for the audience when we come back, but. Um, let's talk about uh, the first one we were going to show. We're actually recording this on Tuesday, the 18th, so we're going to play it tonight. Uh, it's Going Attractions, the history of the movie drive-in. Yeah, the definitive story of the, of the American drive-in movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long time. I know, it's a, it's a mouthful, but I had to get it in there. <laughs> uh, so what I was surprised when I watched the film was how early these actually started. It was back in the 1930s, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first drive-in was in the early 30s in Camden, New Jersey, and it was built by a man named Richard Hollingshead Jr., who was in the automotive care product business with his, uh, I believe his father and he were both in it. And um, they just had the idea that people were going to start buying cars. And um, whenever I read the story, it always said it was for his mother because she was a large woman. So I think everybody thought overweight. And then uh, I actually interviewed the son of the inventor. He's in the documentary. And he said she was over six feet tall. So she wasn't big, heavy. She was really a tall woman. Um, so that's why he built it. Because um, if you've ever been in an old movie palace, uh, like this one that I'm sitting um, in, inside, um, the seats are really small. I think generally people were smaller back at that time when a lot of these were built and, um, and the seats were pretty small. So I can see why somebody really tall like she was wouldn't fit there. So that's where he had the idea to, um, you know, put a projector on the car and uh, he patented the idea um, of the ramp parking system as we know, as we know today at drive-ins. And, um, and that's where it started. But before the war, there was only maybe about a hundred drive-ins around the country. And then there was a shortage of, you know, rubber and metal and things because of the war. So we didn't really take off uh, in the driving business until after World War II. But at that time it was part of all the suburban growth and the idea of, you know, moving out to the suburbs and two car families and drive-ins just were part of that uh, explosion. Yeah, it's so funny to think of uh, the, the 30s cars that I remember seeing on, uh, on film and especially with those those flat fronts and not being able to see really out of the, um, the, the the windshield and being able to see a movie like that. Well, that's why I mean the the 30s cars were huge, which is why you can imagine you know sitting in them for a long time watching a film and or you know all those things. But also um, cars stayed pretty large up until you got into compact cars in like the late 60s, 70s, which became a problem for drive-ins. But yeah, cars were big and they had the, um, uh, not the uh, bucket seats, but the bench seats. So you had a lot of room in there. And of course, that's why the ramp system was needed because it put, you know, as opposed to like a lot of pop-up drive-ins today, they're in a flat parking lot. They really are designed as a theater with rows and a ramp system to give every car an optimal you know, sight lines. So, so there is a little something to a traditional theater in the way that they're designed, traditional drive-ins. And you have footage of many, many drive-ins in your documentary. Uh, how many did you visit uh, during the course of shooting? <laughs> okay, so when I made the drive-in documentary, I did set out to make the definitive story, and I wanted to really explore what happened to them. I mean, that was my inspiration. I, I grew up going to drive-ins, and then as I got a little older, I started seeing them shut down and just abandoned a lot. And I would drive out of my way to visit ones. This is when I was in the Chicago area still, um, to visit ones that were, you know, just sitting there vacant. And I would wonder what, you know, how could this 
be allowed to get into such bad condition and what must they have looked like in their heyday and look at those huge screens and those huge neon marquees and you know they must have really been spectacular and so when i was making the film i ended up traveling the whole country because i really wanted to see where they were located compared to the towns and what they looked like and what you know might be left and and so i drove the country multiple times and uh, for months at a time and i visited every single state and looked at open drive-ins, abandoned drive-ins, remnants of drive-ins, and in some cases, the former site to see what is there today. And I went to Hawaii for another film festival for another film, and I went and looked at drive-in locations there. And the only state I have not made it to is Alaska, not because they didn't have drive-ins, they did, but I just haven't made it there yet. So in total, um, I have visited over 500 drive-in locations. Yeah, <laughs> a huge amount. And how many are still operating today? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I know when um, there's a couple of people that keep records and I believe that we were down to about 305 before COVID hit, but I do know of at least three or four that had closed that have already reopened because of the pandemic. And, uh, and then who can count the innumerable pop-ups that everybody's doing, whether they be in stadiums or restaurant parking lots or sometimes indoor movie theater parking lots. There, and you know, every community that that tore down their drive-ins long ago are now growing up, you know, a drive-in somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we have one that popped up in the parking lot for the baseball team downtown. Yeah. Uh, but we have a couple in the sort of western New York area, the Silver Lake down yeah. in uh, Perry, as well as yeah. the vintage drive-in in Avon. So we do have yeah. somewhat of a history. Of, yeah, I've been to both of those. And yeah. also the transit's not too far from you. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a bunch. Um, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, it's kind of interesting because um, those states have always had the most drive-ins and still have the most left. You would think it would be a warmer climate, like Texas or California or something that has the most. But um, I, you know, studying it, we believe it was just a matter of population that even though in Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio, and, and some of those Eastern states, um, they had the most drive-ins just because they had the most people. And, and so even though still 90% of them have been torn down, there's, a, a, you know, the most drive-ins are in those states. So yeah, I've, I've driven around um, New York and upstate New York a bunch of times and visited most of the drive-ins. And they're, they're awesome because most of them are still very original. And you've seen that many of them have become sort of multi-purpose spaces as well. They have flea markets or something else on the weekend in order to help support them and keep them going. Yep, yep. We cover that in the documentary. We talk about the swap meet, which um, in a lot of areas goes hand in hand. And I think it is interesting to talk about it now during um, COVID that because all the venues are closed, all, you know, the music venues are closed and in some cases churches are closed and the drive-in has become a space, uh, you know, community gathering space. I was just in uh, it, it, you can find it online. There was an article for that Time Magazine published a couple weeks ago, and in there um, they're talking about how they have once again become the hub of the community, which is what the drive-ins started as. Um, you know, when they first uh, became so popular after the war, they really were gathering places, and um, they, that's what they're becoming again because drive-ins are hosting church services, graduations, weddings. Uh, concerts, you know, you name it, uh, uh, dance recitals. I've seen all sorts of things taking place at drive-ins now. And hopefully that will normalize it for people so they get accustomed to going back to the drive-in theaters and keep them active. Yeah, we hope so. I've talked to a lot of the drive-in owners and yes, they are all saying they're getting new customers that they've never had before. And uh, one of the owners was telling me the joke in the drive-in business is people are like, you know, well, we didn't even know you were here. And he'll tell them, we didn't go anywhere. You did. <laughs> We've been here. <laughs> you just forgot. And so, um, yeah, it, it is nice. And, and I, I was saying this when I released um, this documentary a few years ago, 
I was saying how everybody in the United States, they were so pervasive. There were almost 5,000 drive-ins at the peak in the late 50s. And even though they started falling off, you know, once you got into the 80s because of multiplex indoor theaters and blockbusters and cable and all these things that hit the, hit the industry at the same time, there was still every generation in the United States, you know, from the baby boomers up through the 80s at least, and sometimes into the 90s, that all of us went to drive-in theaters. It didn't matter who you were, where you were from, of kids that are getting to have that drive-in experience. And it's really great because, you know, the thing about drive-ins or going to a, a, a beautiful movie palace documentary, yeah, I, I had some of the owners and a lot of the owners that uh, were, you know, second or third generation in the business. So I tried to, you know, uh, show the history through their eyes, their family, their experience. Um, I also got Roger Corman to be in the documentary and I, I met him outside of the New Beverly Theater actually in Los Angeles. They were screening one of his, the films he had directed. And I just said to him, you know, I'm making a documentary about drive-in movie theaters. And he said, oh, if you want me to be in it, just call my office. He volunteered right away because he knew that he was part of that story and that history. And um, it was a wonderful experience to meet him and interview him. And um, one thing that I did not put in the film is that he didn't like drive-ins. <laughs> As Roger felt like, you know, and this is funny coming from him because he's known for making things that are so low budget. Um, but he, uh, he felt like, he told me he put so much effort into making his films look and sound good. And when he went to the drive-in, um, it was on the old speakers that had kind of a tinny sound. And, uh, you know, in over the years, the, the you know, print quality, they'd get passed around theater to theater. So the print quality would be degraded. And sometimes the bulbs would start to dim. And these were some of the issues that exhibition was. Throughout his career. And uh, to have your film play in the same theater where he was honored just seems like it's it comes full circle. Yeah. I well, think that leads. I, I really admire him because he he started the careers of so many people, and he was just a person that he supported create creative people. If they had an idea and wanted to make something, and they they had a budget that he could agree to, he just let them go and let them do it. And you look at all the filmmakers whose career he started, and he didn't care. Uh, you know, what color you were, if you were male, female, whatever. He was equally supportive of everybody, always. So he he really was a pioneer and such a, you know, inspiration to so many people. So I really admire him. Yeah, his, his comments about the presentation are particularly important to us as a museum where we pride ourselves on the best presentation in town. Uh, when you were going to all these theaters, did you see any operating 35 millimeter projectors anymore? At drive-ins or indoor theaters? At drive-ins. Um, there's only a few. There's one called the Mahoning in, in Pennsylvania that only plays 35. And uh, a few of them, like I know the Benji's in Baltimore has kept both digital and 35. Um, but most of them uh, got rid of their 35 when they had to switch to digital. Yeah. I'm going to have to check out that Mahoning and see how far it is away so I can drive to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I uh, became aware of this documentary uh, through Amazon Prime Video, where it's streaming there, but I understand uh, it's, it's available in more than just that if someone wants to see it. Yeah, I have a website, uh, goingattractions.com, and uh, it has a page for each of the movies. So if you go to the drive-in documentary page, it will tell you all the places that you can watch it streaming or you can um, purchase it. So it, it's everywhere. There's a DVD you can buy direct. It's on bestbuy.com, barnesandnoble.com, walmart.com, everywhere. And then um, Amazon is one of the places, but it's also on, I think it's on Vudu and Tubi, and I, I don't even know. <laughs> a lot of. <laughs> and hopefully at the drive in theater sometime soon. Well, I did play a lot of drive ins when it came out. I, I, I got to, you know, I, I'd already visited over 100, but I got to visit a lot more when I, <laughs> when I released the film. At which was a very cool side effect. And I got to be a double and triple feature with a lot of cool films too, like Smokey and the Bandit and Jaws. <laughs> and, you know, I never thought I'd be, you know, playing, you know, alongside Jaws. That was really fun. <laughs> 
So did that film lead directly into the second Going Attractions film, which is about the movie palaces? Yep, yep. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I grew up going to movies um, going to drive-ins, also going to movie palaces. We had a neighborhood movie palace called the Dunes right down the street in the town I grew up in, which was Zion, Illinois, which was on the uh, northern edge of Chicago and on the border of Wisconsin. And um, so I, I went to movies all the time and, um, and that's why I've made two films about film exhibition and that history. Um, although I will say the Going Attraction series I would also love to do roller skating rinks. That's um, what my family's business was growing up. I would love to do mom and pop amusement parks. People don't realize there were tons of private amusement, amusement parks before everything became Six Flags or Disney. And, um, and I would love to do bowling alleys. So I have a whole list of going attractions of things that were attractions or amusements that are you know few and far between nowadays. Uh, but exhibition um, of films and getting into these theaters um, there's such an integral part of the movie business in general and how it involved is how how it evolved is how we see movies. And in the movie palace documentary, I think I got into that even more, uh, really talking about the beginning of of cinema and uh, and how that evolved over time. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was interesting to note that that the glory period for Hollywood filmmaking seemed to be the 1940s where there was so much money uh, going into all these films and they could do just about whatever they wanted. But for the movie palaces, it was actually leading up to the Great Depression, right? In the, in the 20s, there was a lot of them built. Yes. So the movie palaces were built, most of them, in a very compressed period of time from the very late 19 teens up until... Well, a lot of people say Radio City Music Hall might be one of the last ones, which was in the early 30s, but really, you know, tiny 10, 10 to 12-ish time period. And it was just because films took off so quickly. We cover in the film, um, you know, sort of the early films in Penny Arcades and Nickelodeons. But as soon as people realized this is a business and the studio system was formed, um, most of those studios built their own theaters. So when you see theaters left behind that are called Paramount or called Fox, uh, you know, those are from the studio system. And there were a lot that started as vaudeville houses. So they would have live performances. Anytime you see something called Orpheum, that was probably started as a, a vaudeville theater. And, um, and so some of those converted to movies once that became a thing in the teens and 20s. Um, and then of course sound came in in 1927. Um, but yeah, then you get to the Great Depression and um, they stopped building them. So almost all, you know, there were other theaters constructed after that, um, but they were smaller and not as ornate. And then eventually you get into the multiplexes that a lot of people grew up in. Um, so a lot of people know theaters like I'm sitting in because they might go to concerts or they might go see a touring Broadway show and have no idea um, that they were built for movies. <laughs> yeah, um, I was thinking about the difference between what you must have done for the two documentaries because, you know, your, your second unit or your coverage for the drive-in theaters, you, you sort of just have like the marquee that's left or sort of the decrepit. Uh, screen that, that's coming down for the ones that have closed. But for the movie palaces and all the ornate detail, you must have taken a lot, a lot of footage of just all of these palaces just to make sure that you were getting something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tried to include as many as I could, but I did take a different approach and I, I didn't travel everywhere. Um, but I tried to represent everywhere and represent um, all the types of construction and all the different architects. So I tried to be comprehensive, um, even though I didn't have as much of a travel budget. Um, so there's a lot of theaters I would love to visit and I was visiting them when I was, uh, before COVID hit, I was in the middle of a theatrical release for the Movie Palace documentary and we had to stop touring, but I got to visit so many gorgeous theaters and I fall in love with every single one of them and I wish every single one of them were in my film. But what we tried to do 
we shot the interviews in um, New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. And part of why we focused there was because that was the migration of the film industry that it kind of started in New York and then moved to Chicago and eventually moved to Los Angeles. So we covered it that way. And then um, actually, as I was traveling with the drive-in movie, when I was in different areas, I would shoot some B-roll um, when I was traveling with the drive-in movie. So that's where I got some other shots of other theaters around the country. And then the other thing that we tried to do to make it inclusive was um, we uh, got support from the Theater Historical Society. And they have collected a very large photograph archive and um, they opened that up to us. So a lot of the old black and white photos came from the Theater Historical Society. So, um, you know, through all of that, we do show a ton of, of movie palaces in the documentary. Um, not as many as I, as I would like, but um, as many as I could get in there. <laughs> So we did have uh, an employee at the museum who was part of the Theater Historical Society. He would tell us about these tours that they would go on, uh, even for theaters that had closed. Did you have any of those uh, experiences where you went into the old closed ones and you saw them sort of falling apart? Oh, yeah. They call it the, the uh, Conclave, and um, they have it every year in a different city. And so I've been part of a few of those. I visited some of the theaters when they had that event in Chicago. They had their 50 year anniversary a couple years ago in New York City and I visited a lot of theaters on that one. And uh, of course they had it in Los Angeles um, a few years ago too. Um, so yeah, people that are members of that group, they look forward to that annual event, which of course is not taking place this year. Um, I think it's actually biannual, it might be every other year. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, and, and they work hard to get you into different theaters that are still standing, whatever condition they may be in, or whoever might own them currently. Like when we were in uh, New York City, uh, a lot of the, the big ones that are left are converted to churches. So mm. they would get permission from the churches to let us get inside and explore. So you managed to get uh, more high profile guests for this documentary, including our friend Leonard Moulton. Yes, um, so Leonard was one of the first people that I got on board to be part of this documentary. And it was because I had gone to a screening at, um, at the United Artists Theater, the one where I interview him, um, which is in downtown Los Angeles. And he gave an introduction to the film I was going to see, and I can't remember what film it was now. Um, but, um, but I realized as he was speaking, because I, I know of him as a film critic, of course, but when he started talking about uh, the theater that we were in and some of the other theaters on Broadway, I realized that he has a, a great knowledge of the movie palaces of these venues. So in addition to knowing film history and being a critic, I realized he really did have a vast knowledge about these places. So that's when I approached him to be in the film. And of course it was right in his wheelhouse and he said yes. And then, and then we probably had a year and a half of trying to schedule. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's fantastic. And, um, and he and I had a, an experience before, before everything shut down when the film was traveling. Uh, we played at the Sonoma Film Festival and, um, and he and his wife um, came and sat next to me and, and watched it there. He watched it for the first time and that was really fun. So current plans with the film, we're still going to see it theatrically. We're not uh, going to put it out on digital. It will be. Yeah, it will be out on digital. Um, I believe that we're shooting for October, sometime in October. And, um, and then we do have a broadcast partner that I can't announce yet, but it's a very, uh, it's a place that's a very good fit for the film. Um, so we will be announcing soon, and we're hoping to pick up once theaters come back. Um, I, I'm sure that we will continue to play, especially in historic theaters. Um, a lot of them have talked to me about helping to celebrate milestone anniversaries with the film or using it, you know, because there, uh, most of the historic theaters are still uh, in constant fundraising mode because there's always things that need to be fixed or maintained. So. 
I think there's a lot of ways that, um, you know, people who are interested in, in historic venues like, like these um, will continue to enjoy the film for a long time and probably, you know, program it and book it. So uh, we'll see. I mean, that's what happened with the drive-in one. I obviously, look at now, who could have guessed that so many people would be watching it, even though it came out a few years ago. You know, I, uh, I always get a interest in it every summer in drive-ins because there's a summer season and then people think about drive-ins again and people watch my film. So that one, even though it came out a few years ago, it's had continued audience. And I think the Movie Palace one is going to be the same, especially... Um, I've mentioned the pandemic so many times, but it's really affected theaters because they're, they're closed and there's no new product coming out of the studios right now. It's very minimal what's being released. And so they're having a hard time and getting, you know, ramping back up, they're going to have a hard time. Um, so it's going to become even more important for those of us who value that, you know, seeing a film in a dark, empty space uh, you know, where you can really focus and see it on a screen that is larger than life. Um, you know, those of us who value that experience are really going to have to get out and support that experience. So I hope that, you know, my film can help be educational of why it's important to, to keep and save and, and maintain and support these places. I, I certainly agree with that. And that's uh, one of the main reasons that I was programming these to reopen our theater when we were done with construction and done with the pandemic, but we're not done with both yet. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, I figure both films, you know, everybody's homeschooling now. So both films are certainly great education for our kids. <laughs> so maybe we'll get some of that. People can, you know, work the drive-in documentary into their home curriculum or something. Yeah. <laughs> the history of America. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I, this, I mean, it, it's funny. We, we laugh about that. But yeah, we say that uh, in in the Movie Palace documentary, how it is really interesting that this is such an important history of America. This is one of our bi biggest exports is the film industry to the point that in other countries, they built palaces for royalty or for religion. And in our country, we built palaces to see films. So that shows you how important um, they are. And, and yet, you know, over time, we have not valued those buildings that are so, such a big part of our country's history. Wow, what a perfect uh, thought to end on. Uh, we want to invite everybody to our own little palace uh, when we reopen. April, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And please uh, go see April's movie, Going Attractions, The Definitive History of the American Drive-In Movie. Very close. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> on one of the platforms at goingattractions.com. And uh, please look out for the movie, the, the movie palace documentary, hopefully at the Dryden, and if not, sometime uh, accessible soon. Thank you. Thanks, April. We really appreciate it.